And the first passage comes from John, John's Gospel, the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then from Galatians, the fifth chapter, just one verse, the first verse. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Here ends the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'll never forget a few years back, an English lady accosted George Beverly Shea after a Billy Graham crusade in London. She felt it was in poor taste for him to sing an American patriotic song as part of the crusade. Mr. Shea wondered what in the world she was talking about. She said she heard him sing, It Took America to Put the Stars in Place. <laughs> of course, it's, he sang, It Took a Miracle to Put the Stars in Place. It's important what we say and what we hear. The children in the first grade were singing, God Bless America. The teacher heard one little girl singing it this way, Stand beside her and guide her with the light through the night from a bulb. <laughs> it makes sense. The students in a junior high American history class were given an examination. Among the questions to be answered was the following. The Declaration of Independence was written chiefly by, and you were to fill in the blank, on one of the papers a student had written, it was chiefly written by candlelight. In another class, the third graders were shown a model of the Statue of Liberty and were asked what she was doing, and one little girl said, she was taking a shower. <laughs> another said she was raising her hand because she knew the right answer, but she was cheating because she had a book of answers in the other hand. Yes, it's the 4th of July on Wednesday, Independence Day, the day we celebrate the birth of our nation and the freedoms we cherish and seek to preserve. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for our country, for the men and women who have given <clears throat> their lives to protect this land and to preserve the many freedoms we enjoy as a people. We thank you for those who established this country, who came here to worship you freely, who established the rule of law based on the scriptures, who set into place the great experiment of democracy. You are the source and spirit of freedom. You have given us the freedom of choice to love you or to reject you, to honor your name with respect, or to curse your name in anger. What an awesome God of love you are. We thank you for the freedom to worship you, to say your name out loud, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that our ultimate allegiance is to you. Thank you, Lord. And now as this sermon is preached, may your Holy Spirit take these words and transform them into the words of truth and hope that you want us to hear this morning. Anoint them, for we offer them in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for saying amen. One of my favorite writers is the French philosopher and theologian Jacques Ellul. 
Out of all of his writings, I particularly like the following three sentences. The great fact which emerges from our civilization is that today everything has become means. There is no longer an end. We do not know whither we are going. We have forgotten our collective ends and we possess great means. We set huge machines in motion in order to arrive nowhere. There is no longer an end. We do not know whither we are going. On this Sunday, three days before Independence Day, I want you to hold those thoughts about means and end because I want to preach about the three R's of freedom and to lead your thinking with me to ultimately get to the end that Jacques Ellul was writing about. In many ways, it's what the Apostle Paul was suggesting in our text for this morning from Galatians 5.1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Freedom. What a precious idea. What a powerful idea. What a profoundly important idea. But freedom is not easy to define. And yet we know that freedom has been considered throughout human history so precious that hundreds of thousands of human beings have willingly died for it. There have been sons and daughters of this congregation, <coughs> excuse me, who have given their lives for the cause of freedom. I think I'll keep this close by. <clears throat> I read this week about the Italian philosopher Giordano Bruno, who died at the stake in the year 16,000 for his freedom of belief, and of Galileo, who whispered to himself in the face of the Inquisition that the earth does move around the sun. But the love of freedom and the willingness to die for it is also true for hosts of people whose names are forever unsung and unknown. Freedom, obviously, has by its very nature a profound connection to the very core of every human being. I can't think of many other ideas that are the object of such devotion and longing in the human spirit. Listen to the definition of Webster's Unabridged Dictionary for freedom. He says this, one, the state of being at liberty rather than in confinement or under physical restraint. For example, he won his freedom after a retrial. Exemption from external control or interference or regulations. Three, the power of determining one's own actions. Freedom of choice. The power to make one's own choices or decisions without constraint from within or without. A sense of autonomy, self-determination. For example, freedom of speech or conscience, freedom of movement, freedom of religion. There are many great minds that have contributed to our understanding of freedom. Henrik Ibsen said, freedom is our finest treasure. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was profoundly impressed by the fact that people will endure hunger, fire, the sword, and death to preserve only their independence. He said human beings sacrifice pleasures and repose and wealth and power and life itself for the preservation of this soul good. The great philosopher Immanuel Kant joined in the defense of freedom against those who argued that the terror of the French Revolution showed that the masses of people were unfit for freedom, he wrote this, to accept the principle that freedom is worthless for those under whose one's control and that one has the right to refuse it to them forever is an infringement of the rights of God himself who has created man to be free. 
I believe that Kant was right. Freedom is an inalienable right that God has created within the human heart, within the human psyche, a desire to be free, which is so much more than political freedom, as special and precious as that is. But the freedom to choose to love God or to deny Him, it's so much more even important than political freedom. To be able to say that we love God or to deny Him, it's an amazing gift of God who wants to be loved, but only when expressed in freedom. It's the great risk that God established from the very beginning of life on earth. He has given us the freedom to choose right or wrong, life or death. That's why Jesus could say in no uncertain terms when he said to the crowd around him, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Powerful words. Because freedom, in the biblical sense, is the greatest foundational freedom of all. It is based on the truth of God himself, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you are a disciple of Jesus, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But let me get to the three R's of freedom. The first R is relative. The second R is responsible. The third R is rooted. Let me tell you by, uh, what I mean by each of these. Freedom is relative. St. Paul was battling with persons within the early Christian community who wanted to impose Jewish law on brand new Christians. The Judaizers referred to in the book of Galatians wanted to encumber the new believer with such legalistic requirements as the right of circumcision. St. Paul's position was that Christ has set us free from such requirements. He asked, why should we return back and submit ourselves to the very yoke of slavery from which Christ has delivered us? Some disagreed because freedom is relative. Freedom is always relative. There is no such thing as absolute freedom. Every once in a while, a group comes along proclaiming that they believe in freedom from all conventional laws or mores, free speech, freedom of, of expression, free love, but it's an illusion. Freedom is relative. Yes, you can yell fire in a public assembly, but unless there is a real fire, you'd better be prepared to end up in court with a fine. There are times when your freedom impinges on my freedom. In a free society, we're always caught in a balancing act between freedom of various groups. For example, one of our most progressive laws are those calling for universal access to buildings. Thank God for such laws. People with physical disabilities ought to be free to go to the same places that everyone else can. I'm sure all of us would agree with that sentiment, and yet even a noble sentiment such as that has its complications. A few years ago, Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity bought two dilapidated buildings in New York City's South Bronx and spent several hundred thousand dollars to restore them into homeless shelters. But New York's officials told the nuns that under the city's universal access law, they were forbidden to open the shelter. Why? One building lacked a $100,000 elevator to accommodate homeless men who might be unable to walk. The sisters suggested that they could carry any such men to the upper floors themselves, as they do in Calcutta. No way, said the officials. That would insult the dignity of the homeless. And in the case of a fire, the men would be totally dependent on others to rescue them, as the argument went. But then if there was a fire, you can't use the elevator anyway. So the missionaries of charity, who at the time were unable to raise the additional $100,000 for the project, scrapped it 
and were forced to leave hundreds of homeless men sleeping in the street. One person's freedom was another person's indignity. A number of recent zoning cases have, been, have even affected the right of worship in private homes. In Colorado Springs, Minister Richard Blanche has been repeatedly cited for holding religious meetings in his home in violation of a city zoning ordinance. In Fairhaven, Massachusetts, local zoning officials ruled that Bible studies are home occupations and therefore prohibited under the town's property use ordinances. In Los Angeles, officials ruled that home occupancy regulations forbade Orthodox Jews from holding prayer meetings in their homes. As civil liberties lawyers could not help but note, in a Stratford, Connecticut case, home Bible studies are penalized while Tupperware parties enjoy the full protection of the Constitution. This is the first thing we need to see. Freedom is relative, and it's not the lack of all constraints. St. Paul was calling persons to a higher form of freedom. Secondly, freedom is responsible. It is always yoked to responsibility. Some people complain about being yoked to a spouse or yoked to a heavy family responsibility or yoked to a mortgage. They may not use the word yoked, of course, but they might say they were tied down or trapped. But if most of them are honest, taking on that yoke of responsibility could be the best thing that ever happened to them. It often forces us to use our abilities to the utmost. That's the paradox found here in the teaching of Jesus in all of the four Gospels. Take my yoke upon you, Jesus said, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Those of you who have grown up on a farm or ranch know that a yoke is a wooden frame used to harness oxen and horses. The two animals are bound together. They share the load equally as they plow the fields. Jesus knew all about yokes. He had spent many hours helping out in Joseph's carpenter shop. A good carpenter would customize yokes carefully, measuring the animals. The yoke had to fit perfectly. If it didn't, it would harm the animals. It could neither be too big nor too small. Can you imagine back then purchasing a yoke from Joseph's carpenter shop with the initials made by J.C. carved on the side of the yoke itself? My mind does crazy things. True freedom for the believer is being yoked, connected to Christ. When the going gets rough, he is there right alongside of us, encouraging us, sharing the load, helping us to make it through. Take my yoke, Jesus said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what being in partnership with God of the universe is all about. Amen. How can a yoke make us free? The truth is that everyone is yoked to something. People who have no responsibility often become yoked to their own laziness, their own sloth, or to their own self-indulgent whims. Many people who are not yoked to Christ, not connected to him, who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, often become selfish and connected to the unhappiness of a dying world without much purpose or direction. There is no end in sight. The Apostle Paul often talked about being a prisoner to Christ, of being in Christ, of being a slave to Christ. But in that connection, he said he was free. There is a freedom in Christ that suddenly gives your life such a purpose, such a buoyancy for life, that the word freedom has a meaning far greater and more profound than any definition or political reality can ever describe. St. Paul writes here in verse 13 of Galatians 5, For you were called to freedom. 
Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love be servants of one another. A few verses later, verses 19 and 20 and 21, St. Paul lists some of the sins of the flesh that follow when freedom is perverted. And this is how the message translates those verses. It's obvious what kind of life developed out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods. Magic show religion. Paranoid loneliness. Cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community, And Paul says, I could go on. And he then reminds the Galatians, this isn't the first time I've warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. Sounds a lot like the moral decay that is happening in the United States, doesn't it? True freedom is always yoked, always connected to responsibility. A recent survey indicated that only 13% of Americans still believe in all 10 of the Ten Commandments. Nine out of 10 citizens admit they lie regularly. For $10 million, 7% of the people in the United States say they would kill a stranger. That's scary. How long can a land remain free that does not have a core of shared values? A person is a slave to whatever controls him or her. Many believe that freedom means doing anything we want, but no one is ever completely free in that sense. Sin has a way of enslaving us, controlling us, dominating us, and dictating our actions. And I want to declare it strongly on this Sunday before Independence Day. Jesus can free you from whatever slavery that keeps you from becoming the person God created you to be. Jesus can break sin's power over your life because freedom is relative. Freedom is always yoked to responsibility. Thirdly, freedom is rooted. It is rooted in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God is the author of true freedom. There's no real freedom in this world if all we have to look forward to is the grave. Why speak of freedom at all if we are held eternally captive by sin and death? To have any real freedom, we are going to have to escape the bondage of our own mortality. It's what Jacques Ellul wrote about, which I quoted from at the beginning of the sermon. The great fact which emerges from our civilization is that today everything has become means. There is no longer an end. We do not know whether we are going. We have forgotten our collective ends, and we possess great means. We set huge machines in motion in order to arrive nowhere. Freedom is knowing that because of what Christ has done on the cross, no power on earth can destroy us. Freedom is looking into a mirror and seeing there a man or a woman with integrity. Freedom is no regrets. Freedom is knowing our sins are forgiven. Freedom begins at the foot of the cross and the empty tomb because ultimate freedom is being delivered from the guilt of sin. St. Paul lists some of the characteristics of this kind of freedom here in verses 22 to 24 of Galatians 5. These are the words, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the characteristics, says St. Paul, of persons who belong to Christ Jesus. 
Those are the characteristics of people who are genuinely free, who know the ultimate end and purpose of life is spending eternity with the author of freedom. This understanding was in the mind of the young writer of our national hymn, My Country Tis of Thee. Only 23 years old, Samuel Francis Smith was a student at Methodist Andover Theological Seminary. He was studying for the ministry, and he wrote the American National Hymn in less than 30 minutes on the second day of February, 1832. The song was first sung on July 4th, 1832, at the Great Park Street Church in Boston, that church just off the commons with a steeple that seems to go forever. It was sung at a children's patriotic celebration. I love the last verse, especially where it says this. Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing, long may our land be bright, with freedom's holy light, protect us by thy might, great God our King. Members, friends, and guests of Covenant Presbyterian Church, that's the kind of freedom you and I need. Yes, freedom is relative. Yes, freedom is yoked to responsibility. But even more importantly, true freedom is rooted in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let us give thanks to God for this free land in which we live. But let us also lay claim to that freedom that is our birthright in Christ. Only when we are joined with Christ can we ever say that we're truly free. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for these words of Scripture that remind us where true freedom comes from. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for who you are and what you're doing in our lives because we have experienced the freedom, the freedom that was designed at the very beginning of our time here on earth. Give us courage to defend these principles, for we ask it in the strong name of Jesus Christ and for his sake, amen.